This video is sponsored by TryHackMe. I have long been at war against Rust compile times. Part of the solution for me was to buy my way into Apple Silicon Dreamland, where builds are like faster. I remember every time I SSH into an x86-64 server, even the nice 64 core ones. And another part was, of course, to get dirty with Rust itself. I wrote why is my Rust build so slow, which goes in depth into Rust build performance, down to Rust C self-profiling even. I wrote an entire series about Nix packages. I switched to Earthly, then it died, and now, well now, I'm like everyone else, humbly writing Docker files. But no, no, I'm not like everyone else. They said Rust wasn't dynamic linking friendly. Well, I made it play nice. With with tools like Dilo and Rubicon solving issues like whoops, Tokyo thinks there's one distinct runtime per dynamic object. And I was able to ship the software that powers my website, which is called Home and is now open source, by the way, as a collection of dynamic libraries, which was great for fast deploys since each library made for a natural container image layer. No code changes equals reused layer, as simple as that. And then I stopped using dynamic linking for my blog because I thought Rusty's built-in support for dynamic linking might work for me, which involved removing all of my custom stuff and finally reverting to upstream Tokyo, which was a relief. And when I realized that, haha, no, Rusty's dynamic linking support does not work for me at all, then I didn't feel like going back and I decided to attack the problem from another angle. The main reason I care about build times is because I want to iterate quickly. Despite Rust's if it compiles, it probably runs, and if it runs, it probably does the right thing, ideal, I want to be able to make changes to my website and see the results fast enough. And when I'm done with changes locally and I want to deploy them, I want CI to run fast so that it can be packaged up as a container image and deployed all around the world to however many points of presence I've decided I can afford this month, and then Kubernetes takes care of doing the rollout, but let's not get our paws dirty with that. That means I end up building my website software a lot, and I've had a chance to look at build timings a lot. And well, I have a couple of big C dependencies like Z standard or libjxl, a couple of big Rust dependencies like TenTV, and a couple other dependencies that showed up a lot like Sin and Surday. I've done the homework before in the virtue of Unzin, the Sin crate is often in the critical path of build. Using causal profiling, we established that making Sin magically faster would in fact make our builds faster. And I say our builds, comrade, because if you go check now, there's a very solid chance your project also depends on sin. My CMS home depends on sin 1 through 6 different paths and on sin 2 through 25 different paths. That's not a mistake. There's two versions of this error. There's clap, of course. There's async trait, display doc, various futures macros, perfect hash maps, Tokyo macros, tracing, zero vec, zero eyes, zero from, yoke, so on and so forth. And of course, survey. And I can see myself replacing some things on that list, but survey. So it is a tough cookie. As of May 2025, Sin is the most downloaded crate ever at 900 million downloads, and Surday is a close 11th with 540 million downloads. These crates' popularity is well deserved due to how useful they are, but the more I looked into them and the more I became dissatisfied. A person's natural reaction to having a crate that builds slowly might be to split it into multiple crates, but with Surday's approach, that does not make much of a difference. And to understand why, we must talk about monomorphization. Let's say you have a bunch of types. Because you have an API and you have JSON payloads and, well, you have a, a catalog like this. And it keeps going, you have metadata, you have business information, you have addresses and whatnot. And it's like because you have good instincts, you're putting all that in a big API nash types crate. And then for narration purposes, you have this in a big API and direction crate where you do the serialization and deserialization. And finally, you have an application, big API dash CLI, that merely calls do serialization stuff. If we go solely by quantity of code, the worst measure of any Thing ever, the CLI should be super fast to build in direction as well, because it's just a couple calls, right? And big API types should be super slow since it has all those struct definitions and a function to generate a mock catalog. Well, on a cold debug build, our intuition is correct. On a cold release build, however, it's very much not. Indirection takes the bulk of the build times, but why? Because to string pretty and from stir are generic functions which get instantiated in the indirection crate. Every time we touch big API indirection, even just to change a string constant, we pay for that cost all over again. If we touch big API types, it's even worse. Even though all I did was change a string value and generate mock catalog, we're good to rebuild everything. That's monomorphization. And also, relink don't rebuild should fix that. All generic functions in Rust 
are instantiated. The generic type parameters like T or K or V are replaced with concrete types like U64 or string or slice. We can see just how often that happens with cargo LLVM lines. Emitting dash dash release gives slightly different results. LLVM is not the only one doing optimizations there. We have about 40 copies of a bunch of different generic survey methods specialized for our given types. This makes survey fast and it also makes our builds slow. And our binary is a bit plus sized, if I'm being honest. But this is fundamental to how Surday works. Mini Surday, same author, works differently, but I can't test it because neither UUID nor Chrono have Mini Surday features, and I can't be bothered to fork it. I adopted a different strategy. I figured that a second Surday would be a very hard sell. It would have to be so much better. The first one was so good, so adequate, that it would be very difficult to convince people to go the trouble of moving to something different. So I decided that whatever I replace Surday with in my own stuff, it will not be faster, it will have other characteristics that I care about. For example, if we fork our program to use FastHead instead of Surday by changing these to these, the indirect crate now uses facet JSON for JSON and facet pretty instead of debug. And then let's assume we have a new CLI that depends on that indirect crate. How does it compare to our older Surday powered version? I want to mention that I'm not entirely happy with the numbers we're going to see, but I thought it was important to make a factual survey of the current state of Facet and use the frustration that it generates in me as motivation to keep working on it. But hey, as of yesterday, we are faster in one benchmark against Surday JSON. If you serialize a 100 kilobyte string, then we only take 351 microseconds on whatever machine Codspeed uses. Codspeed is good, by the way, go use it. They're not sponsoring or anything, but they're just like good. Back to our sample program, things don't look as good. Our program is even bigger than before, didn't see that one coming. And this time it's harder to figure out why. Trying out cargo bloat on the survey version, we can clearly see where all the code is going in the interaction crate as mentioned. But on the facet version, STD is the main offender, and then we have big API types, and then facet initialized. The code is spread rather well across different crates, which makes me hopeful about build times. Like, do those pipeline at all? Do they build in parallel? On a cold debug build, the types crate takes longer than it did in the survey version, but it doesn't block others from building the whole way. On a cold release build, we can see that facet deserialize, pretty serialize, and JSON are all able to build concurrently, and any crate that is using indirection could also build alongside it. I'm pretty sure that's also the case of the survey one, it was just too small to see. So bigger binaries and more build times, at least for now. What do we get for that? For starters, I don't know if you noticed, but we lost the debug implementation. We're not using it to print the deserialized data. We're using facet pretty. For a one-time cost, we get nice formatting with colors and everything. And even supports redacting information. If you don't want street numbers to show up in logs, you can just mark them as sensitive when deriving the facet trait, and then they're going to show up as redacted. You can disable colors, of course. And because facet pretty relies on data rather than code, you could limit the depth of the information it prints, something the debug trait definitely isn't flexible enough to do. And that's the whole idea of facet, the derived macro generates data instead of code. Well, it also generates a lot of virtual tables so you can interact with arbitrary values at runtime and those show up in cargo LLVM lines pretty bigly. Although I suspect there's some low hanging fruits left there in terms of binary size optimization because from the beginning, I've only spent a couple hours focused on that specifically. So our executable shows nicely called struct using the data exposed by facet and using that same data, facet JSON is able to serialize and deserialize our data to and from the JSON format. Surday is the clear winner in terms of speed. I'll let you check the up-to-date benchmarks for exact numbers, but at the time of this writing, we're seeing facet JSON be anywhere from three to six times slower than Surday JSON, which, you know, I'm not mad about. I want to get closer, but it's not bad. Especially if you put it on a log scale, then it looks really good. I wish I had the time to do something more rigorous or more automated, but alas, deadlines. So for now, this will have to do, and you'll make me the promise that you will take those silly micro benchmarks with a little grain of salt. Because as far as I, the end user, can tell, they're both instant, right? Both CLI tools just start and finish. This isn't Ruby or Python or Node or whatever. It's still Rust, right? You can just do some dynamic things now. What about warm builds, warm release builds, because we can barely see anything in debug builds. Uh, our big API isn't actually that big. When changing a bit of big API times survey, we see this. And when changing a bit of big API times facet, we see that. We find ourselves in a somewhat similar situation. Actually, those take approximately the same time. But if we use dash j1, 
like I did in my article about Anzin to make Sin look bad, then it makes Facet look bad. Surprise. Because now it takes over four seconds to build the indirection crate. Hey, I can't use just the tricks that make my crate look good. All right. Now, I'm pretty optimistic about this, honestly, because I think we went a bit wild adding a bunch of marker traits and re-implementing standard traits for tuples if all the elements of a tuple implement that trait, for example. That's not free. Looking at cargo LLVM lines again, why is Cole Wands accounting for 33,000 lines of LLVM IR? Why is set numeric value, which basically converts U64s into U16s and vice versa, account for over 6% of the total code size? See, I wish I had time to look into it more right now, but it gives us kind of a baseline to go from, right? Because the basic idea remains, it is a fixed cost. There's only a handful of small generic functions and facet adjacent. Very quickly, everything goes into reflection territory. It's not monomorphization at play. We're using data generated by the derived macro with structures like struct type, which you can see here, with each field having an offset and a shape of its own. There are function pointers all around to be able to invoke display implementations, fromster, comparison, etc. It's all designed so that you can write code that is compiled once, which runs against arbitrary types. Of course, that will require unsafe code to read and write from arbitrary memory locations, which is extremely relevant given today's sponsor. I'm excited about today's sponsor. You notice how I'm always excited about today's sponsor? That's because I choose my sponsors wisely. TryHack Me allows you to learn cybersecurity no matter your experience level, and it lets you learn by doing, which is something that is very, very dear to my heart. I could absolutely never sit through a lecture back at uni. I always had to have a laptop and hack on something, probably getting Gen2 working. TryHackMe offers over 900 hands-on labs and over 400 security challenges. You'll be hacking real machines, investigating real-world attacks, hard bleed, pickle rig, I know this one, and you'll be doing it all from the comfort of a web browser. Start from your current skill level, no matter what that is, and work your way towards actual certifications that can get you actually hired. Certifications like Security Analyst Level 1, Junior Pentester 1, These certifications have been developed in collaboration with employers like Accenture and Salesforce and can make the difference in your job application. Speaking of, TryHackMe also comes with a careers hub where you can discover new roles, take quizzes, prep for interviews, and discover what a career in cybersecurity really looks like. Head over to tryhackme.com, use code LIME20 for 20% off and start your journey into cyber today. No, cyber today. Cyber today. Your journey into cyber. Today. So like I said, it would require unsafe code to read and write from arbitrary memory locations. So there is a safe layer on top called facet reflect, which lets you peek at values. For example, we can navigate through these structs to extract some field with something like sort adjacent value, but that operates on the actual struct. Oh yeah, and by the way, facet supports rename and rename all, and it does so at the reflection level, not at the serialization level, which is why we have to use the camel case name to uh, access the field. And it also supports flatten, which works we're very pleased about. I say we because I started it, but there's now like a dozen of us just hacking together at it. On the right end of things, Facet Reflect lets you build objects from scratch, like so. Here we're showcasing bits of the API we use when we don't know the shape, like iterating through fields, and also when we know the shape of some bit. We honestly could have used set directly in that case. It's really a matter of which parts of your program you statically know about and which parts you don't. Looking at this, I'm thinking about several things, like debug printing, for sure, but also structured logging, a la tracing, uh, generating mock data for tests, and so on. Even just for the serialization use case, there's much to be excited about, because we're generating data and not code. Entirely different JSON parsers can compete on an even playing field. They all have access to the exact same data. For instance, certain JSON is recursive. If you, like me, have the darkness in your heart, it's relatively easy to come up with a program that makes certain JSON blow up your stack. First, you need a pretty large struct with a bunch of padding, and then you generate a bunch of nested JSON, and then you have certain JSON parse it, and boom, Stack Overflow, which is almost dead, by the way, RIP Stack Overflow. In release, the code gen is more efficient, so we need a bit more padding, and then the result is much the same. Uh, LLDB is kind enough to show us the stack trace is just a bunch of survey functions recursively calling each other. To avoid that problem, and since we were going to be slower anyway, facet JSON takes an iterative approach instead. 
we need to derive facet instead of deserialize. You know how to port it by now. And we also need to mark each default field as default explicitly. There's no implicit behavior for option at this time. We're discussing it. And then use the fromster from facet JSON instead of the one from sort JSON. That's it. It's pretty drop in as far as replacement go. Can you say that? I don't know. And with facet JSON, boringly enough, it works. That's it's so hard to sell because like it works, right? It took us weeks to make it good, but now it works. And it's just like, oh yeah, there you go. It's just doing the job it's supposed to do. Are you happy? <laughs> and you know what's fun? The facet version, which works, is faster than the third adjacent version, which crashes. I mean, this, this means nothing. It probably just means that macOS faults are being slow, but I chuckled at this. Like we've seen, facet JSON today is iterative rather than recursive, and this comes at a cost. But there's nothing preventing someone from coming up with a recursive implementation that's faster. We don't use SIMD yet, but someone should. We're not doing a tape-oriented approach to JSON decoding, but I hear this pretty cool. Did I mention it has nice errors? Look at this. I didn't want to linger on that, but you know, it's nice to know where our tax dollars, I mean, our build minutes are going, you know? I want facet JSON to remain flexible. I think it should support trailing commas if the deserializer is configured that way. I think it should support inline comments optionally. Also, I think there's a way to support asynchronous IO. Because why not? All the state is already on the heap. It's already pinned, so an async runtime should have no issues with that. In the opposite direction, if we find that using the heap is slow, we should try alternative allocators, uh, arena allocators, bump allocators, maybe, or just maybe something general purpose, but a little more modern than the system allocators. I haven't done any benchmarks with like Jamaloc or Mimaloc or any of the others, but that could be interesting. Back to flexibility, one cool thing we could do is have XPath style selectors, or like CSS style selectors when deserializing. So you could filter out nested data. Maybe I only want the first 10 children of an array of a struct field of a struct field. The deserializer would do the minimum amount of work required to get me that while still being able to validate that the data has the right shape, something a lot of people appreciate Surde and Rust in general for. And finally, a pipe stream of mine, just in time compilation, JIT, to enhance deserialization speed. Not just to be able to take advantage of the best possible instructions at runtime, but also to take advantage of what we observe from the data. If the object keys always go one, four, two in that exact order, with three missing and like four out of order, then we can generate code at runtime optimized for that specific pattern, but only once we've observed it. So we can never do that with a head of time compilation. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what we can do with reflection. Right now, we're hitting limitations in the language. Type ID is in const, comparing two type IDs in const is impossible. Cycles in constants are not supported, and there is no plan to support them for now. This means that we have to add indirection through function pointers to break the cycles. Specialization is unstable, so we have to use auto deref tricks inspired by the spez crate, which means we're generating a lot of code just to make sure that something implements a trade or not. There's a lot that isn't ideal, but it's such fun redesigning the entire ecosystem. We have crates for JSON, YAML, TOML, XDR. Uh, there's some work in progress for KDL. XML is up for grabs if anyone wants it. And we're not going to need like prefix fields by at or dollar sign uh, like we do in quick XML in Surday. Uh, let's make them first class citizens in Facet, right? Let's just have a tag attribute. I'd like a nice assertion library. Imagine Facet pretty, but in your tests. I'd like a property testing library based on facets. We know what we can mutate where it is, we can check for invariance. With a few more custom attributes, we could give enough information to know which values to generate instead of running the struct level invariance method in the loop. And, and something we've explored very little so far, facet for functions. Manipulating values is all fun in games. And I've been fantasizing about an HTTP interface that lets me inspect the entire state of my program, like my web server. But the next step is obviously an interactive REPL, exposing functions that we can call dynamically on top of which we could also build RPC remote procedure calling, uh, all with the same great tooling that is becoming a standard in the facet ecosystem. And you know what's a little like serialization and deserialization? Uh, FFI, foreign function interface, exchanging values with other languages, or maybe even with databases. Why couldn't we have facet SQLite or facet Postgres? These seem like natural fits to me. There's still a lot to do around here, and the churn is real. We've had major rewrites every other week, but I think the potential is enormous. So come hack with us. It's fun. Thanks for watching.